This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nye. It is indeed. Good morning, everybody. Well, this is an interview that during the course of my career, I'm really quite surprised I've never done before. It's almost odd that I've never done it, fortuitous that I'm about to. I saw, like everybody else, the movie, uh, The Amityville Horror. And isn't it odd that uh, the man involved in that happens to be just over the hill from me in Las Vegas. George Lee Lutz was born and raised on Long Island. His birth was any indication was meant to be different from the beginning. Seconds after delivery, doctors raced him into surgery and mended a large crack in his skull, one that should have killed him. His mother often said that she thought his miraculous recovery was a sign that he was destined for something special. At a very young age, George displayed a remarkable mechanical aptitude. At the age of 12, he modified a hobby kit hydroplane, adding his own custom-designed water ski jets. It was only the beginning of a lasting love for boats, canoes, rowboats, runabouts, sailboats, almost anything that would float on the water. Later, the fascination grew to include cars, and today George can remember the color, interior design, make, model of every car he's ever owned. That's a bunch. At 19... He volunteered for the Marines. <laughs> My parents were Marines, so he volunteered. Uh, and later went on to earn two degrees with honors uh, at an FAA course that, he led, that led then to a job in Boston as an air traffic controller, one of the high-stress jobs in the world. His father's death a short time later took him back to New York to run W.H. Parry, Inc., the family's land-surveying business. George, who was born and raised Methodist, who always considered himself more of a devout realist, married for the first time in 72, divorced in, in 73. Short marriage. During the process of his annulment from his first marriage, George met Father Ralph J., I believe it's uh, Pecorero, Pecor Pecorero, we'll get it, a Catholic priest, an ecclesiastical judge within the archdiocese of the church with whom he quickly forged a strong and lasting friendship. In 1974, after years of profitable business management and years of enthusiasm and training in the martial arts, George met Kathy Connors, who had three children from a previous marriage. A year after George and Kathy's first date, they were married, and soon they began searching for a house of their own. A nest, right? By the summer of 75, they thought they had found their dream home, which happened to turn out to be a two-and-one-half a uh, story Dutch colonial in the quaint Long Island community of Amityville. Little did they know that a legend was about to be born. In a moment, the truth, the real truth behind that legend. <laughs> Here from Las Vegas, Nevada, just over the hill, is George Lutz. George, Hi, wel Paul. hey, welcome to the program. Thank you. God, it's great to have you. Uh, George, you're, you're not on a, um, uh, what kind of phone are you on now? I'm on a hard line. Oh, you're on a hard line. Okay, good. We've got a bit of static tonight. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. I hope it uh, doesn't get us. All right. Uh, what are you doing in Las Vegas, by the way? Uh, right now I'm repairing computers and restoring old cars. Uh huh. Old cars, your love. <laughs> uh, it's what I enjoy the most, but I have uh, what's called fibromyalgia, so uh, there are times when I just can't do the work. I understand. Um, well, all right, George. Uh, maybe we'll investigate the possibility of another line or another telephone. It was good. I, w I wonder what happened. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's odd. Uh, there's no other phone line open, is there? No, not in this house. All right, let me try this uh, and reset this and see if that helps. All right, anyway, uh, George, um, I, I, it's hard to even know where to start, except all my life, you know, I saw the movie, and all my life I've been hearing about uh, Amityville. And, in fact, a man that I interviewed who's now passed away, of course, Father Malachi Martin, said to me in the course of an interview that um, uh, the Amityville house was one of the most haunted places in all of America. This was a live interview you did with him? It certainly was. Yes. So I assume hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people heard this. Oh, absolutely, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. 
Uh, and I, it, I, so I'm not sure where to begin all of this with you, except I guess, you know, in in the bio there it said that you and Kathy had just married and you were looking for a brand new house to live in and. It's the nesting thing. You know, you get married and you get a family and you want to go and you want to find a place, you know, to have that family. And, and that's what you were doing. Well, we both had homes. We, we each had our own home. Oh. So we, the idea was to sell both homes and get one that we could look at as both of ours. Mm-hmm. That's right. right. Something new and something that belonged to both of you. Well, I'm I not sure Kathy liked my house or I liked hers either. Oh. So it was one of those, let's go find something we both like. Yep. Makes sense. And she had three children, and so it really made sense to put them both up on the market, and then whichever one sold first, move into the other one, and then as soon as that was sold, hopefully we would have found another house by then, and it did work out that way. Yeah. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember how old the children were at the time? Roughly. Uh, I believe Missy was not in kindergarten yet, so she would have been like four. And then uh, Chris and Danny would have been, oh, seven and nine, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I'm sorry. It's too long since I've tried to remember those things. Yeah, a long time ago. Well, you're going to be trying to remember a lot that's been now a long time ago. Hopefully I'll do better. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, folks, uh, George has a cold, too. We both have cold. So bear with both of us. It's, it's tough to think clearly. It's tough to do anything when you're in the middle of one of these monsters. How we've gone to the moon, done all this other stuff, now even cloned the first human, according to the Raelians, and we still can't cure the common cold, George. Doesn't make sense to me. That's pretty amazing. Yep. All right. So you went to look at the house at 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville. Uh, all of you, I presume, or just you and Kathy? No, all of us. All, even the children, huh? Yes. And we had a criteria that was we were trying to find a uh, home on the water because I had a boat then that um, right. wasn't trailerable, really. And... It was important to have the boat close by rather than travel back and forth to it since we tried to use it as much as we could. Okay, well, you knew, I presume you knew, uh, about the DeVeo massacre that uh, six people had been murdered in that house. I mean, that's a very serious thing to have occurred. Six we didn't people. know this when we first went to see the house. We knew it after the realtor told us after we toured the house. It was a pretty good price, right? Uh, the the market it had been on the market for I believe a hundred thousand or so and uh, by then it had been reduced if I remember correctly to ninety we made an offer of eighty and they accepted it really uh, what what do you think uh, George what do you think market value was for that house then real market value well it was the house was four thousand feet it had a, a boathouse that would take a, in easily a thirty six foot boat at the time. It had a two-car garage attached to that, a, a heated pool, a full basement. Uh, my guess would be then realistically 125000 would have been not un, yeah. unheard of. All right, then. So at some, some point, you must have, uh, you must have asked yourself uh, or the realtor, hey, how come, maybe after you, you, know, you, you consummated the deal, uh, how come it's so cheap? Or when did you find out six people had been murdered there? Uh, after she showed it to us, and it was obvious that Kathy had fallen in love with it, and I liked it very much, uh, she said, I don't know if I should have told you this before I showed it to you or uh. after, but this is the house the DeFeos were murdered in. And we kind of looked at her like, what do you mean? And then she reminded us of the news stories that had been a year earlier and the trial that was just, I guess, in the process of starting or was going on. All right. For those who don't remember, uh, can you tell us about the DeFeo murders? I mean, this, this, this DeFeo fellow said that he, I, I think at the time, he claimed that he heard voices telling him to kill his family, right? Ronald DeFeo was eventually convicted, yes, of uh, killing his mom, dad, two brothers, and two sisters. And for that, he, he served what? While they were in the sleep, and while they, while they were asleep, went around with a shotgun and dispatched them. I think uh, it was a Marlin 36 caliber rifle. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and he's now serving, I think, six uh, consecutive lives. consecutive life terms, um, supposedly with no possibility for parole. But a hearing comes up every year or so. I I imagine the house had been cleaned up. There was no sign of the uh, massacre that had occurred there. Oh no 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 nothing like that. They the house showed like any house would. And, George, you're looking at it, and you're looking at the water thinking, oh, my God, yes, right? Oh, 
Yeah, it's, we weren't looking for an eighty thousand dollar or ninety thousand or hundred thousand dollar house, um, but we were certainly in the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range when we considered we had two homes that sold for over forty thousand each. Yeah, yeah. And the just the fees on keeping our boat in a marina back then sure. really made the the difference uh, very well as far as the money went. And I had a successful business that had been my grandfather's and my father's, so it wasn't something that uh, well, we went. I'll put it this way: we went to one bank, got qualified there, and got the mortgage right away. Didn't have to go around the shop for a mortgage or apply anywhere else. That's interesting. We had we walked in with a little over twenty thousand dollars down, so we ended up with a sixty thousand dollar mortgage. Did did the uh, family? You must have sat down with the family, you know, family conference at some point. Look, this horrible thing happened here. Uh, can you handle that fact? Do you love the house? Do you still want to move in? Oh sure, we asked the kids Art if uh, they, you know, if this was going to bother them because if it was going to be an issue with them, then we would have certainly walked on on considering the house. They were all fine with it. Was there a- anything at that point? I mean, none of the children, uh, nor Kathy, nor anybody said, "Look, uh, what if it's haunted or anything like that?" I mean, that never really even entered your psyche, or did you Not- even consider that? Not considered in that way, no. No. It was, you know, look, you're going to have the same bedrooms that these kids had and they were killed here. Is that going to be a problem? You know, that kind of thing. We asked them and we talked about it at length as a family. It wasn't a snap decision by any means. We went back and saw the house a number of times. Um, One time Kathy and I even went down in my boat to see it from the water, see if we could find it. Mm -hmm. Uh, South Shore isn't always the easiest thing to get up into the little rivers and whatever and, and find a house along there. Did you uh, and Kathy have enough from your other the sale of your other houses uh, to afford the 20000 the down payment? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, are you a religious person, George? That means something different to everybody. Uh, back then, I, I think um, absolutely not. You know, I believe the, in the Lord's Prayer, that kind of thing. I was a non-practicing Methodist. Uh, okay, okay. But... Today, uh, what I believe is my own personal beliefs, and there are some things that I believe are pretty unshakable and have been proven to be so over the last 25 years. And Kathy? Very. I would consider Kathy very religious. Okay. Um, Kathy has a ministry that feeds thousands of people in Phoenix every year, homeless people. Uh huh. Um, then you met uh, this, uh, and you're going to have to help me with his name. Father sure. Ralph, is it? Pecorora? Father Ralph Pecorora. Pecorora, okay. okay. Um, when did you come in contact with him, and under what circumstance? He, he was a, an ecclesiastical judge. Um, he sat in the diocesan office uh, for the Catholic Church there in Rockville Center as a judge, ruling on various cases that came subject to church law for the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. My first wife, that uh, had a, uh, she had applied for an annulment. Um, meant that I had the opportunity to go in and be interviewed, if I wished, about that annulment process. And I didn't understand it uh, at the time, and so I went down and met with him. He called me and invited me in to do that. I really didn't think it was a necessary thing. I really didn't care whether she got an annulment or not. Um, I wasn't really sure that an annulment was proper, but end result is that's how I met him. Okay. What kind of man was he? Extraordinary. In what sense? He he read and spoke nine languages. Had an equivalent degree from a law degree from Oxford. Um, he met you on your terms. You didn't have to go to him. He was friendly and smart, and he, he took his time to explain things to me why it was important that this annulment be granted and uh, what the conditions the church considered it to be proper, properly so. But more than that, he um, I didn't realize at the time that there was something unusual about him in the sense that he's an ecclesiastical judge. I just figured that was his job. Mm -hmm. I realized the kind of degrees he had or the intellect involved in doing such a job or how you get to, to do that. So I guess you all may, became fast friends through, became through good, this process. Good friends and talked on the phone uh, maybe once every 10 days, 7 days, sometimes 2 weeks. But 
it was always going to be he was going to come to dinner, meet Kathy and the kids, that kind of thing. All right. He ended up, anyway, you became friends, and yes. he ended up blessing this house, uh, right? Yeah, and I should tell you how that came about. I'd uh, like to know how it came about, yes. I, uh, one of my hobbies was building Harleys then, and a friend of mine, Jimmy Lascalzo in New York, had a Harley shop in East Northport, New York. And Jimmy, when I told him what house we were buying, the DeFeo house, right. he said, you've got to get the house blessed. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you've got to get a priest and get the house blessed. And I went home from that and asked Kathy about that. And she said, oh, yeah, well, that's something you do if you're a Catholic and you get buy a new house, you do that. And, and, she, and she, especially she, in this case. Huh? And we didn't know any priests. No. <laughs> so Kathy was a non-practicing Catholic at the time. And so I called Father Ray and asked him if he would do it. And he said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to. Little did I realize that wasn't the kind of thing that a... Uh, this was at, this was after you moved in, George. Or well, no, this is before we actually still. closed on the house. Ah, okay. So it's one of those things you do supposedly when, as soon as you can when you buy it. All right. So, so it was coordinated that he would come in the day that we actually had the closing that afternoon. Gotcha. So we were moving in when he showed up to do that. And uh, so boom, boom, boom. Here he comes and begins what? I'm moving through the house to to bless it. I don't know how that's done. Well, I hadn't I hadn't actually even seen him arrive, and I hadn't seen him since I had seen him in his office. That I recall now, when I think back about it, it's the first time I'd seen him in months. I talked to him quite a bit, but always on the phone. So there he is, going into the house, and I waved. I was in the back of the truck unloading the U-Haul, and. A number of our friends were there. Even one of Jimmy's brothers was there helping unload the, you know, the stuff and moving it into the house. Sure. Moving day. We um, <laughs> we were a little bit behind because after we'd closed on the the finances in New York, you do real estate a different way than you do out here. Uh, you go to a closing and they have their attorney and the bank has an attorney or a representative and you have your own attorney and they all sit there and they write everything up right then and there. Sure. And the title company has someone. It's a, it's a different process than it is anywhere else that I've seen. Well, uh, we had forgotten to get the key at the closing, so we had to go back and find the realtor and go back and get the key and so we could get, actually get in the house. Right. And there are all these people waiting around to help us move in. So he showed up, and we were quite behind time. You know, it's starting to get dark. It's November. And so I waved at him, and he went on in, found Kathy, and went about blessing the house. Which means what? You go to room, from room to room, that kind of thing? Yes, he went room to room, said prayers in each room, um, using holy water. And, and there are, I guess there's a house blessing that they do. It's, I'm not privy to the words. Uh, nor am I, uh, but very interesting. Uh, all right, st stand by, George. We're already at the bottom of the first hour. It goes very quickly. Uh, George Lutz is my guest. He's the man, along with his family, who lived the real Amityville Horror. And uh, as the night progresses, we're going to get that story as it really occurred with the time necessary, which you have with the luxury of radio, to extract that kind of information. So that's what we're up to this night. George Lutz is here. I'm Art Bell, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Ghosts, or the presence of evil, seems most frequently to show up uh, at places where great evil has been done. Like the DeFeo murders, for example, six family members murdered, slaughtered. That's one. There are other occasions, but that's probably the most frequent with regard to hauntings, something evil around. No question about it. So the setup was there. In a moment, we'll get back to George Lutz, who lived the Amityville Horror. <laughs> Again, uh, from over the hill in Las Vegas, here is George Lutz. George, um, okay, uh, so I guess we'll call him Father Ray. Yes. Blessed the house, went room to room, blessed the house, and then um, came back and told you what? He was a bit uncomfortable in the upstairs back bedroom. The uh, I wanted to pay him for coming. He wouldn't accept payment. Tried to give him a bottle of Canadian Club. He wouldn't take that. Uh -huh. um, we invited him back for dinner. He stopped and just said, he asked us what we were going to use 
one bedroom four, which was on the second floor in the back, and that was evidently uh, the bedroom where the two boys had been murdered. So he told you uh, not to use the second floor sewing room. I, I, I've got a little echo. Let me try to get rid of that. The, the second, he told you not to use the second floor sewing room at all, or, or as a bedroom, or what? We, we, Kathy explained she was going to use it as a sewing room, and that he said was fine. He just there was something about the room that made him uncomfortable, and he and he, he managed to communicate that to us without any alarm or anything. I, do, I really don't know how to explain this other than he asked what we were going to use the room for. He said he felt a little bit uncomfortable there, and that's basically what he said. And so you didn't you didn't really probe uh, and and want to know the exact whys and wherefores of the warning. No, he wasn't uh, he wasn't forthcoming with it. He was um, it was like he wanted to leave, and uh huh. They, we weren't going to use it as a bedroom, so it wasn't an issue. All right. It was just it was a strange thing for him to say, but it was like, okay, you have to leave, and that's all you're going to tell us, obviously. You know, thanks for coming. Good night, and see you later. Really? Yeah. We all invited right. him back another time, you know, to come back for dinner, and he said he would, and that was it. All right. I, I've got somebody else here who had impressions of the house um, who's on the line I'd like to bring on. Uh, Mary Pascarella was the lead psychic who investigated the house along with Ed and Lorraine Warren. I've interviewed them in March of 76. Mary is a professional psychic and time walker who picked up on some truly terrifying things when she visited uh, your home. She said the case had a profound effect on her. It was the first time she had ever encountered something she could only describe as pure evil, pure evil. Art, I don't know that she's ever been interviewed about this. Well, she is going to be now. Uh, Mary, welcome to the program. Well, good evening, Lee, and how are you? Hi, Mary. Hey, honey. How are you? Where are you, Mary? I'm in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, you, so you've never been uh, interviewed in this fashion before about w what happened? No. We, we had we had a strange arrangement with that. I'm I'm very private about things that I do, and it was just something that I wasn't comfortable doing. You are private because I'm pretty familiar in this field, uh, Mary, and I'm not familiar with you. Uh, so you are obviously are very private. Anyway, you went into the house at the behest of Ed and uh, Lorraine Warren. I've interviewed them. And, uh, and, and what happened? Can you, in your own words, what happened? Um, we went in at a time when the North Carolina team was out there from Duke. And uh, I had not met Lee. Um, when I go any place, I'm... I always say, don't tell me anything about the house. And Ed called me one night and said, I have a case I'd like you to investigate. And what is your impression? And I said, I see a white house with a fan window. And he said, okay, don't say anything else. Right. And yet we'll get in the car and go. And when we arrived there, it was uh, there was a team there, and we could not go in. And they went up and got pizza, and I stayed in the car. And uh, then I walked out to the back of the house because... Um, I like to get feelings of things. Yes. And um, when I got into the back, um, I had heard water, and so I saw a pool. I thought, well, that's it. There's the pool. There's the water, and discharged that. But while I was in back there, I usually say some. I'm Catholic, and I usually say some prayers before I go into a house. So it was my quiet time, and I looked up into the window in the back of the house, and I saw the face of a, of a young girl looking back out. A young girl. Right. And I had never, I knew nothing of the, the Fayos. Um, I hadn't met Lee. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, George. Um, Either one works, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're Lee to me. <laughs> so uh, I had not met the family. Uh, but because children were involved, and I'm, I'm a proverbial mother, um, I was only interested in doing the house because there were children involved in the house. Of course. Um, so I looked up and I saw the face in the window. It later became, uh, it was the sewing room, I, have, um, I believe, that was the upstairs window looking out. That would be the one Father Ray talked about. Right. And at that time, I, we hadn't been in the house. Um, when you enter this house, it's, uh, it's very deceptive. When I first went into the house, I said to Ed, these people are really weird. We're not even going to think about this. This house is beautiful. And the house was beautiful. Uh, uh, the Lutzes had uh, decorated the house. So you walked in, and it was a beautiful home. And 
It gave you no feeling, no sensation of anything other than a house. Um, that comes much later. All right, but, but at some point. Um, when I went upstairs to um, – the first thing that we did when we went in is there's a dining room to the right-hand side, and um, that had a table that had dishes and things. Later we cleared some of that. Um, when you go, there's a stairwell as you enter, and then when you go down, there's another stairwell that goes down to a, um, a, a basement area. When you get into the basement area, there's a little laundry room off to your uh, right-hand side of okay. the stairs. And then there, I looked to the left, and there was this um, large game room. And the game room had a pool table and uh, family things sure. where a family would enjoy themselves. Sure. In front of you, there was a little door, and it was into a small, like, a cold cellar, you know, the old houses that had, uh, uh, like, a little root cellar. Oh, yes. Yeah. So you open the door and you go into a root cellar. Um, I never could really go into that room because it had an odor to it. Oh. Um, now, you have to understand that um, I was under the impression and that the house it had nothing there. But I investigate the house to see, because I walk time, to see what possibly could have affected it to cause people to be affected by the house. And um, so we got to the laundry room, had some some clothes that were on the floor. So I'm Mrs. Clean by nature, and I picked up the clothes and threw them in and washed them, figuring maybe if there was an odor there, it might be the, the uh, clothing themselves. So, because um, it was definitely like a a dirty sock smell or something that had soiled. A foul odor. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, like a, um, just a, an odor. And um, I'm one of these people that is very fussy and very clean, and if there's a smell, I'll either find the source, and as a psychic, if you say a, a refrigerator's in the air, I better be able to put my hand under it. Or otherwise, I'm not going to believe that there's a refrigerator in the air. You know, you have to use logic. Um, well, I know that sock smell. My mom told me my, my socks could march the way to the, the washer by themselves. <laughs> when, when I was about 13 or 14, it was awful. Well, I'll tell you, the, the lessons were in, impeccably clean, and the house was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, what they lost, I'll never be able to replace. That was for sure afterwards. When you sit down, and the reality is, is that there has to be something that drove them away because it, it, there, there was more truth in that house as you got to know it. Well, I, I, you know, I know the finances of all this, and the people who say this is some kind of farce or hoax are full of it because the money thing doesn't add up in any way you look at it, either before, during, or after. None of it makes any sense unless. Oh I mean, no, because. That house had to have his possessions alone when you walked in and you knew you were walking out. I thought they were very affluent because they had collections of coins and uh, things. You know, he was a collector, obviously. But that's, that's a moot point right now. So. What, what is important, though, and what I want to get from you is what you sensed finally in that house. Okay. Um, when you go up the stairs, from the first stair to the seventh, there, there's a there's a cotton batting feeling, a feeling of wrapping, and it's as though the something terrible had happened on that stairwell, uh -huh. and that was the first sense of something not quite right. Um, going up the stairs to the sewing room, I walked in and I've been blessed with with an imagination or a mind that can see time, and there was a young woman in there. Um, I'd say 15 or 16 with long brown hair and parted in the middle. And if you remember those little moo-moo dresses oh, that they course. had, yes, the paisley things. Yes. And she was crying. And one of our jobs, as uh, one of my jobs is if you see something that's misplaced, you try to place it back. So I started to say some prayers and said, go to the white light. 
because I knew that then I thought that was what the haunting was. Um, and so I said, go to the white light. And at that point in time, it was as though the house did not want that soul released. And you started to feel pressures and uh -huh. anger. Uh -huh. And then when you walk out to the hallway, I felt that I had given her the white light and she had gone. Um, in my mind. But there was evil, real evil in that house? Mary. Absolutely. Absolutely. After the investigation, there was a, I could never go to the third floor. Uh, when you walk down the hall on the right-hand side, there's a stairwell. Well, I'm not allowed sometimes to do things because I'm one of these people that still be, believe in a B&B &B and and the tooth fairy and things like that and so I'm 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 not good with evil or bad things. Um I don't think many of us have confronted uh pure evil uh directly. Father Malachi Martin spoke of it many times and I I still um I, I, I even the concept of, of evil uh, as an entity as a as pure thing is um, it will stand the hair on the back of my neck straight up, and I, 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 I have a sense, but that's all. I've never confronted it directly, nor do I wish to. Well, neither had I, and um, um, I had a group of friends. I worked for the Diocesan Bridge Board at that time, and I had a school, and um, I had four priest friends, and whenever I went anywhere, they always gave me holy water and borrowed one of their Bibles and a cross and brought it with me just as a kind of a protection for myself. Because you never know if you don't, see, people don't understand that if there's good, there's evil. Yeah, I understand that. You just don't touch it as frequently. And because we're locked in a clock time, uh, we don't walk the perimeters. Yes. The one thing that I did know well, about that house was it was not the original house. Um, I used to be an artist. And I can, in my mind, blueprints will form, and I can, I kind of sense when something's real or not real. And the thing that I knew immediately, without having met Lee, was that this was a man that was protecting his children yes. and his home. It had nothing. I don't even think he believed in in us as psychic investors, investigators. I mean, not truly. I think his main concern was the amount of money that he invested in the home of course and his children yeah that's the real world but but uh, bottom line mary uh, in your investigation there was no question in your mind you had encountered in that house pure evil pure evil I mean, we had a set, we had a channel 5 that was doing a séance and i was to be the least psychic in that um, uh, we had gotten um, to the point where I, the house had began to affect me, um, and I had gotten up on the stairs, and I called down to Ed, and I said, Ed, I'm as sick as a dog. Well, I had this little room upstairs. I believe it was Missy's bedroom. Yes. And um, that was my haven. I could go there and feel perfectly safe, perfectly safe. So I said, Ed, I'm going to lay down in the bed for a little while. Because I'm, it was either that I hadn't slept or whatever. And so I began to say my prayers, and I was saying the Our Father. And as I was saying the Our Father, I looked out of the door, and there was a young man that was with me taping. And I looked out of the door, and as I was saying the Our Father, um, there was a group of figures standing outside of the door saying the Our Father backward. I thought, oh. Excuse me, but that 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 doesn't sit well with me. I'm also a stubborn person that says, "Don't threaten me because I'll stand up and my fists go up." And is there I any question, Mary? Is there any question in your mind that DeFeo uh, souls were trapped in that home? Um, I didn't know about the DeFeos at the time, but I, I did I understand. know. Yeah, I did know that uh, in one of the bedrooms, I. I sensed a young man who was crying as though he had done something really bad. So I knew two things about this house. I knew, one, that someone was forced into a position to commit something really horrible there. Didn't know what it was, but did know that it happened. Um, that 
there was a force or an energy in that house that was subject to taking hold of somebody, and I will say this now, and I'll say it till the day I die, that since we don't know what time is, and time in time is only a fraction of a second, that the energy in that house remains. It may take a hundred years of our time, but it will implode again. And that house is purely evil. I took the holy water and threw it outside to the figures. I took the cross and I raised the cross and I said, I said a prayer and I said, God is with me. And I threw it and I, did you ever throw water on a fire? And you get this kind of a little hissing sound? Yes. Well, that's what the sound was. And the kid that was with me. I thought he was going to faint. But, again, that's the house. The house is deceptive. It will take an innocent person, and I believe Kathy was such a sweet and an innocent child, a girl, a young woman, and it affected the house. It affected curious children. Uh, and Lee was the strength in that house, so the house could never really affect him only make him angry and want to find out what was the matter. You're very well aware. The investigators, uh, the investigators, Mary, um, uh, caught a photograph when there was no child in the home, an eerie photograph that will stand the hair on the back of your neck straight up, up at the top of that stairwell, caught a photograph of a child when there was no photograph in, of any, or no child in there to be photographed. They got a photograph of what appears to be a ghost child. I've got that on the website right now, www.rpl.com. Is there any question in your mind that photograph is one of the Lutz, uh, excuse me, not the Lutz, the DeFeo? No, the DeFeo, God forbid. Uh, yeah, God forbid, right. The DeFeo children? I believe that since I was not allowed up on the third floor to, the, to where the children were, the boys, I believe, were, uh, that it was probably one of those. And do I believe they were trapped? Yes, I do. I think that the girl escaped into what uh, may have been another room of haven and that what Father felt was a presence without being able to be aware that there was a presence there. Uh, you know, us Catholics are trained in a very different way. And, Mary, you believe that house is going to, as you put it, implode again? Absolutely. You, right. get a, you get somebody that's very susceptible Mary, we're out of the thing you walk, time, and I've got to go. But I want to thank you for calling in, and, and, and thank you so much. Okay, and I'm totally, I'm on and listening. All right, Go Mary. Ahead. Mary uh, Pascarella, George Lutz is my guest. She walks time. Uh, that was some stroll she took in that house. I'm Art Bell. Indeed so. Uh, my guest is George Lutz, who lived with his family, the Amityville Horror, Incidentally, I'd like to thank Dan Ferens for uh, uh, helping to make all of this possible and assisting with uh, some of the material from the History Channel's documentaries, which he did on the Amityville Horror. In a moment, we'll get right back to George Lutz. Welcome back to the program. Hi, Art. Um, you uh, have uh, described what happened in that house at Amityville, George, as, um, oh, I don't know, I guess a kind of a three-ring circus. Now, many, many in my audience have either read the book or seen the movie, and the movie, of course, dramatized the heck out of what happened, I suppose. That's, I, a, nice, that's a really nice way to put that. Is it? It's, it was very Hollywood. Very Hollywood. All right, but what's the real story, George? What, what really did happen there? It didn't happen all at once. Uh, I, when I think back on it now, I think my perceptions of it are different than they were then. It seemed at times then that it just was like a rolling snowball that got bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, nobody, no family pays that kind of money for a house, lays their life on the line, especially a place they love, and then flees a house, George. It doesn't happen without some really serious stuff going on, movie or no movie. 
Uh, nobody does that. Nobody flees a house without uh, a significant reason. What really happened? When we when we left the house, Art, I should tell you that we wanted to get the house fixed. We really did not want to just leave or leave our stuff or give up on living there. Of course not. And so when the opportunity came to put together the, the psychics that went in and investigate the house, the idea was that they would fix it. Yeah, but there was, uh, there, there, there was obviously a lot wrong to fix, and that's what I want to know about. I mean, what the hell happened in that house? Uh, to even bring the psychics on, uh, what, th what made what, us leave, in other words? Well, uh, or even to the point where the psychics came in. I mean, what began to happen in that house, George? By the by, the last week we were there, it was nightly occurrences of noises, the things like odors coming and going, or Kathy being touched from behind by some unseen person. Uh, or Missy talking to herself and, and asking questions like Jody tell, telling us about her imaginary friend that wasn't so imaginary, it turns out. Yeah, she claimed to have an imaginary friend, right? Yes, and she would come and ask Kathy questions like, do angels talk? And really, Jody is the name of the angel, and she Jody is telling Missy that they're, we're going to live there forever. Forever. Um, strange things. It, it's kind of off-putting. Our dog, Harry, um, would not go in that room that Mary was talking about earlier. The The last night we were in the house was the was the, re, was the reason not to stay there anymore. And when we called Father Ray the next day, he asked what we were still doing there. He was surprised that we were still even in the house, and it hadn't even occurred to us to even at that point, to, to just up and abandon everything and, and get in the van and leave. The, that night, uh, Kathy had levitated and moved away across, away from me on the bed. No, 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 wait a minute. Slow up right there. Sure. Kathy levitated. Yes. Now, you were both in bed? Yes. And you were both awake or both uh, asleep or at the time or what? Kathy was asleep. She was asleep. And she lifted up off the bed and went towards the wall away from me. Huh. Uh, this, is, this is after she had turned into an, an old crone, a, a really ugly old woman that literally took hours and hours for it to go away. In front of your face? Yes. And then later she did that again at her mom's house after we moved out of the house and moved in with her mom. Oh, my God. You're sitting there watching your wife, and she turns, and uh, like the picture of Dorian Gray, she, she, she almost instantly becomes an old woman? Yes. And then that, that effect remains for hours? Remain, yeah, one time it was longer than just a few hours. What happened, Art, was that these things, in and in by themselves, for example, I, 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 everyone in that house, all my kids and Kathy slept on their stomachs in that house. After we moved out, we found out that the, the DeFeo murders, all of the whole family had slept on their stomachs. They were all murdered in their sleep. None of them got up. None of them got out of bed or were awakened, evidently, by the, the sounds of the rifle going off, killing all six of them. There were no drugs found in, in their bodies in the autopsy. And they were all sleeping face down. I was the only one that could not sleep face down in that house. I never slept down, face down before that, and I sort of couldn't do it there. Through all of this, uh, George, did you ever question your own sanity? I mean, we don't often look at our wives and see them become a 90-year-old woman instantly and then have that remain for hours. I mean, we, we just don't. Uh, did you question your own sanity? Sure. Many, many times in many different ways. What about, what about the effect on Kathy? Um, uh, Kathy, was she questioning your sanity or her own, or, or were you beginning to understand it was the house? Kathy was damaged in a different. Each of us were affected in a different way, and I think Kathy was damaged in a different way than than I was. And I think that it, for her, in in so many ways, it was much harder for her to recover over the years and 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 be able to put it in a place, so to speak. You know, get, give it some distance, even after moving to California and then later on to Arizona. Uh, 
there were times when she was much more sensitive than I was. Do you think she's do you think she's all right with it now? Has she come to terms now with it, or is it still a uh, bad word haunting her? When we did we did a uh, the special for the uh, History Channel two years ago, and that interview was some eight hours, and she was hooked up to oxygen. She has a um, a disorder known a breathing disorder called Valley Fever that has is quite serious, quite debilitating, and right now she's still in. Uh, a form of a hospital that deals with respiratory diseases. Yeah, I saw the uh, oxygen tubes. Yes. Yeah. Well, she's had a, a relapse since then. Um, that was a very hard day for her. It was, it was, the interview was, I think, something like eight and a half hours, and then afterwards we went out to dinner. Um, so it was a long day for her. And there were times when, you know, certain questions will come up and be worded in a certain way that are really... You can see the effect on her, sure, but um, that happens to me as well. Uh, it's not. This is not a, a comfortable subject. It's not something you know that that has a lot of humor in it. Yeah. And humor is the one thing that that does make it um, less strong, less uh, less affecting of you. I yes, I understand that. I use it myself. Um, it, it is a wonderful tool to deal with this kind of thing. Um, the movie, of course, dramatized the ooze out of the walls and uh, uh, the flies and all, all the rest of that. Uh, the flies were real. The flies were. Well, tell me about that. The flies were. This is the winter time, and the, the back bedroom, that one sewing room, had flies from the day we moved in, and they became more and more and more. And they were there when the investigators went in. Uh, just on the back window. And they, that's the same window that Mary saw the, I guess you'd call it an apparition or a person from the, looking up at it. Um, flies were always there. They were always there. didn't go away. Huh. You'd, you'd kill them and they'd still come back. Really? So that, that part was real? Not the oozing out of the walls. Not the oozing out but of the walls. That, that was... It, it's one of those things that, in fact, is, is sometimes, in my mind at least, stranger than, than fiction. What really happened that I think they tried to draw that from, what really happened in the house was that there were keyholes, old-style old doors. This is, the house was built in the 30s, and it had old-style keyholes. I remember them, yes. They ha we had drips that got longer and longer. They were black. They were almost like an epoxy. And the longer we were in the house, the longer the drips came out of certain keyholes in the oh. second and third floor. Oh, so there was some basis in truth. Yes, but not the oozing out of the walls. Not the oozing, but, right. but something. And then there was, there were, we would wake up in the morning and we would find this gelatin-like substance going from room to room. And you would think, well, the kids got into jello or, or you know, somebody did something. Uh -huh. But there was no jello in the house at the time, and the, the kids didn't do that. Um, and it was sticky, and it it was there. I mean, it was there for the. So what did you do with this stuff? Just try and clean it up, or well, what? Well, it was like spots. It wasn't like a, a you know a big mess of some kind. It just it trapped from room to room. Uh huh. Huh. And Kathy would wipe it up. And just move on. So um, that that was occurring every day. No, that would. I mean, it would. You couldn't depend on anything. The the one thing, thank God, is the lights didn't go out. <laughs> At no time did they, you know, they would flicker, but they did not go out. They would flicker, though? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I see what you mean by a three-ring circus. Um, all of this kind of thing was going on. Well, that, I'm sorry. I, I, I strayed from where I was going before. One of the things was that I would be laying there in bed on my back, and everyone else would be asleep. The house would be quiet, and I'd be getting ready to go to sleep, and I would hear... Or I would be already asleep, and I would wake up to a, a sound of, of musicians, like, tuning up downstairs. Really? And I would think that a clock radio went off, and it was off its, uh, off the station or something like that. And there is no clock radio down there, but that's the first thing that comes to your mind. You, you wouldn't know what else it could be. Go down there, and there'd be no noise, and the dog would be asleep uh, right by the front door. Harry was a big black Malamute. He wasn't, you know. He wasn't a shirking little princess. He was a he was a really cool dog, and he was right. he was in love with those kids. He he was gotten as a tiny puppy. Um, this 
I don't know whether you've ever been asked this, uh, George, but it's a logical question in view of the uh, DeFeo slaughter. Uh, was there ever a time when you found your mind drifting to an awful place where you were perhaps being urged to or considered doing evil yourself, George? It's not a question I've ever answered in public. Really? It's, um, uh, I don't know that I'll answer you this straight out, okay, but what I will tell you is this. The, the tool we mentioned of humor. Yes. I told Father Ray many of the things that went on for us, and he was the one that told me about humor, that evil can't stand it, it can't be in the presence of it, it has no understanding of humor it can't relate to it and it drives it away and I had to learn the the, the mental ability if you will to to be able to think of something humorous when I would get a thought that I didn't like so you did answer it you did get them and that's how you responded um, that's the only thing that's ever worked other than the rosary. A kind of a defense. Uh, humor is a defense. There's no question about it. I mean, you're right about that. It is. And so you were strong enough to muster that up as a defense. Well, it, was a very, it, it became an exercise, but it took years to, to get for it to be just an exercise and not something that was a real struggle. I understand that you actually uh, began to have uh, some feelings of of sorrow or... A caring about DeFeo, who's, uh, you know, going to be in jail for six life sentences. And I, the only reason that I could understand that you would begin to get those feelings is because you would understand uh, perhaps a little bit of what he went through. And that's why I asked you the question, George. There's no doubt in our minds, ever, never has been any doubt after living there, that a sane person doesn't do this to his family. And, and someone with any kind of right thinking or ability to reason that reason has been taken away or has been obfuscated in such a way, occluded or clouded or or they've been separated from their reasoning powers in a way that most of us hopefully will never understand. And there's no doubt in our mind that he was influenced by that house and that he was controlled at least for a point. He provided a service to that, if you will, that um, mm -hmm. was so horrible that he couldn't live with it or realize it himself. And without extreme long-term psychiatric care, no help of, of redemption of any kind in this life. Do you think uh, that um, his case should be reviewed for the reasons you're talking about right now? I don't know that they, what I think, I don't know if that matters. Um, it probably doesn't, but I, it's an important question. Do you had his appeals, they've, they've failed. I don't. I think that a disservice was done to him terribly years ago. That he that it that it wasn't a, a full blown insanity plea. That it wasn't appealed on that basis. That it that it wasn't an absolute. That he needed psychiatric care and still does. I think it's inhumane to think that. Okay, they got the guy. He did it. Yes, physically he did the murders, but um, spiritually, emotionally, no. I, I don't believe that he's in a pure sense, responsible for that as a human being. I think that he needs help, and I don't think that anyone cares enough to, to try to get it for him anymore. We did what we could, and we tried a number of different ways, and his attorney, William Weber, was um, wanted to do a book and make money off him and signed Ronald DeFeo up for a 5% cut of whatever book that, that his lawyer did, you know, put together. So it became obvious that these people were not going to try to help him. Um, the, uh, the final night that you spent in that house, you've never talked about. You've always refused to talk about the last night in the house. Why? What happens, Art, is when you do that, the, the worst of it comes back. It doesn't, it, it's not like it disappeared. It, it's not like I can detach myself and, from it and just talk about it like what I did yesterday. Um, you feel it. Not all of it, thank God, but it comes back and it's not a pleasant experience.
I was laying there in that in in bed. Kathy levitated, and I had to grab her to keep her from going off the bed. There, there is no question in your mind, George. You weren't dreaming this. You weren't asleep. <laughs> you're, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's an obvious it's question. question. Yes. Yeah. No, there's no question. We were so very pleased three years later to have Chris Gugas come along and give us a polygraph test, each of us, in his office with Michael Rice. I was not aware that had been done. Yes. And one of the questions, well, it's a long process. It's not like you walk in, strap on the machine, and go. Oh, yeah. You have to agree to the questions. Um, they have to run a baseline. They do a physiological work up to, to to get within that baseline so that they can get the real responses. Yes. Chris Gugas had taught the uh, use of the polygraph. He was considered number two and number three man in the world at the time. He had taught the use of the polygraph throughout the world for the armed forces, for the, for the Army, um, for their intelligence people. He had uh, been instructed personally by the head guy at the, at the FBI. So that was one of the questions he asked? One of the questions was, did you levitate? Um, one of the questions was, did Kathy turn into an old woman? And you, you answered them all and uh, went sailing past the polygraph. Absolutely. Uh, later, those, those findings were published in the uh, National Star, of all things. Huh. It, was, it was one of those things where the movie company was getting ready to release the movie, and they wanted to do uh -huh. this, and these are expensive tests. Oh, I'm well aware. They were willing to pay for it, and we said, get us the best there is, and we'll do it. Otherwise, we're not interested in doing it with someone that just got out of school. All right. You get five questions. They have to be yes or no. And, that you know, you get one shot at doing this thing right. It's not like you have... Well, George, you know, you know um, people who are lying... Usually don't agree to a polygraph. That's that's for damn sure. George, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. George Lutz, who with his family lived the Amityville Horror, is my guest. And tonight you're hearing uh, the real story of what happened in that home. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. Tonight you're hearing what really happened at Amityville. My guest is George Lutz. Can you imagine? I'm going to ask in a moment. I want to go back to it. Can you imagine looking at your wife and seeing her instantly becoming an old woman, a very old woman, a 90-year-old or better woman? Once again, here's George Lutz. George, when you when you saw Kathy become a 90-year-old woman, or better, suddenly, um, I, I can't even imagine uh, went through what, what would have gone through your mind. I mean, it would have been like out of this house now, gone. I'm out of here, running out of here, actually. But but to see that happen to your wife, apparently more than once. Yes. Yeah, more than once. Um, I, I mean, what went through your mind? Uh, aside from questioning your own sanity, once you realized this really was going on, what did you think was happening? Well, you, you, what occurs to me to answer you right now is that I'm thinking, how do we fix this? What caused this? But not putting it together with the house as such. Did you think you were seeing your wife as an old woman, or did you think you were seeing uh, something else? I had watched the transformation, so I knew it was her. I, did, I wasn't going all of those, all kinds of other places, I don't think, in my mind. Um, no. I don't, I, it's so long ago now, Art, for me to try to, yes. to tell you exactly what I was thinking then. I, I couldn't do it. It wouldn't be right. It w I'd be making something up, up that wouldn't yeah, don't wouldn't do be that. What, what went through my mind then. I know the main thing was, let's, how do we fix this? What caused this? Uh, that's the obvious stuff. All right. Well, obviously, aside... There's a revulsion that, that I remember feeling also. I mean, this is this is not a pleasant thing. Yeah, of course not. Uh, and, and seeing somebody levitate in the air. <laughs> but I don't know that you, you put it to the house. You, you were, well, I, I can understand. I mean, you love that house. You were trying, I'm sure, in your own mind to think of anything else other than the house. Absolutely. When the odors occurred in the in the basement, you go looking for broken pipes or leaks. Absolutely. Um, when you have noises, you go trying to look for the cause of them. 
would be sitting in the, the uh, kitchen at night, and the kids would be asleep, and you'd hear someone upstairs walking around. So you'd go up, and you'd find all the kids asleep in the bed. So you'd come back down, and, and a couple nights later, you'd have some people over, and they would hear the same thing. Then you would know you weren't crazy, and then you would know that something's going on that you don't really understand. But that doesn't mean you just get up and leave your house. Aside from having a priest in, you did, uh, you and Kathy tried to bless the house on your own, right? Yes, we did, twice. What happened? The, <laughs> we were, we basically we were told it didn't work. We heard this chorus of voices, as it's been described, uh, asking us to stop blessing the house. We went around and opened a window in each room. Mm -hmm. uh, a friend of ours, and what I'm, when I said earlier that you have people over and you, they hear the same thing, well, in the process of that, a fellow by the name of Bill Newcomb had come over and, excuse me for just a moment, I have to cough. All right, I understand. I've been doing it nonstop here for days. What a cold. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, he had had a similar problem in his house when he was in a house that evidently was haunted, and he said, you go around, you bless, you do the house blessing yourself. You go around, you open a window, and each room you say the Lord's Prayer. You tell whatever is there to leave, and then you close the window. Well, that seemed like a reasonable solution, especially since here was someone that I had worked for. And he had heard the footsteps, and he knew the kids were asleep. So we went, we did that. Uh, my son Danny's hands were caught in the window in the sewing room. And they were flattened. His hands were, were down. Oh, my God. And the window had flattened the hands. And the immediate reaction is we got to go to the hospital, and we start to go get ready to go. And, and, and what happened? This, uh, this window of its uh, parent own accord came slamming down on his hands? Yes. And it just, didn't just slam down. It was, was mushed in such a way that his hands were actually deformed. They were flat. Huh. So we get ready to go to the hospital, and, then, um, and he's screaming. Yeah, and course. everybody's running around getting their coats and getting them downstairs and trying to calm him down. It was pretty much impossible. And you go to leave and look at his hands and he's fine. What? Um, it didn't occur to us until much later that the house never really wanted us to leave. We would always invite people over. We would have, you know, but we wouldn't, we would go out of our, out of our way not to leave, not to go out someplace. While we were there, we had enrolled in a, a reupholstery course at the local high school. <coughs> so what these colds do you, folks? I'm sorry. That's all right. Um, and we never went to any of the classes. I mean, Kathy went out and bought the, uh, the material to recover the dining room set that we had bought from the DeFeo estate. Um, but we yeah, never I, yeah, that's we right. just don't go out. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a curious thing. Um, you did buy a number of things from the DeFeo estate for the, from the house, right? Yes. Why did you do that? Just because it was a really good buy, or, I mean, what was the reasoning? Well, uh, let's start with we had two houses. Not, not both of us liked each other's furniture. We had garage sales at Kathy's house. We had garage sales at my house. All right. Uh, and now we're moving into a 4,000-square-foot house, and we've got to fill it up if we can with some stuff. Uh they made us a deal we kind of couldn't sort of refuse. Yeah, gotcha. And they had nice stuff. It wasn't like this was blood spattered or anything. It was, you know. Good stuff, yeah. 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 The dining room set was extraordinary. Uh, the kitchen set was lovely. The, some of the dressers that were up in Missy's room were fine. There was no reason not to, to buy all of that. It was there. Yeah, and really, if you're buying the house and you're walking into that and you know what happened, then uh, then what's the difference between that and the furniture or the whatever? Well, they, they weren't, the mattresses weren't there, nothing like that. I mean, we had our own beds. The the It was one of those things that was decided at the closing. What happened at the closing was that they had, uh, <laughs> the people that ran the estate had filled up the oil tank, which was almost another $2,000 and cash that was needed right then and there, too. So the mm -hmm. actual cash out of pocket at the closing, including the furniture and everything, was about 24000 something like that. Mm -hmm. On the last night that we were in there, the I wasn't able to get up out of bed. There was a storm going on as far as we were concerned as a family in the house while we were awake. 
A storm in the house? No, out, it, uh, there was a, while we were in the house, there was a storm going on right around outside. Okay. Big storm. Uh, later, it, was, it has been said that there was no storm there. Well, we know what we experienced, and as far as we're concerned, there was an incredible storm that night. The, uh, the boys' beds were being lifted up and slammed down overhead of me, but I could not get up out of bed to go up and, and deal with that or stop it or see what was going on. What about Kathy? That's when Kathy was levitating and moving away from me and turning oh, into an old God. woman. Kathy was mostly asleep that night. Well, I had brought Harry, our dog, up to and tied him to the uh, master bedroom doorknob for him to stay there at the right there. And mm -hmm. he kept getting up, um, walking in circles, throwing up, and then going back to sleep again. When you when when you say you you couldn't get up, you 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 say you didn't sleep on your stomach, right? You, right. I could not get up out of bed. You literally couldn't move. No, I could not move. And this went on all night long. This went on for most of the night. I was the bed was soaking wet, and it was from sweat. <laughs> Prior to this night, had you been talking to Kathy? Um, at all privately, I, I would assume you would have conversations with Kathy about what was going on aside from the children. Yes, and talking, and she would tell me what Missy would say to her, and the boys were treating each other differently than they had before we moved in there. Everyone kind of went to their own spaces at times. Um, for each of us, we learned later it was a different experience at times in the house. It wasn't like we all experienced everything in unison or saw the same things or heard the same things. Well, that's the next question I was going to ask. Do you have any knowledge, George? I asked you about your own um, state of mind and whether you were perhaps being pushed to do something awful or felt moments of that. I wonder if since you found out that anybody else in the family was being pushed in one way or the other. You'll need to ask me that again a different way if you would. Sorry, I, don't, I uh, want to answer the, this in a way that I am assuming what you're asking me. Yeah. Um, are you now aware that anybody else in your family was being affected uh, in a in a particularly negative way, perhaps to the degree that they uh, they might have done something awful. And if you don't want to answer no, that, no, I, I'm not aware of that. I'm, I, no, that's not. The, the boys were little. Um, Unfortunately, in America, we live uh, in a time where little boys have done some pretty awful things. And so I, you know, if there really was, if there was evil in that home, George, um, its effect could have been different on each and every one of you. It was different on each of us, Art, but it wasn't, I, I don't think of it in, in those terms. I have never considered that that was a, a strong possibility. One of the things we did, the, the, going back to your previous question, though, to, and this will probably help with this, is we, talk, we tried to talk to Father Ray a number of times. We got phone static, got hung up on, unable to call him from the house. I would go to my office and I'd be able to talk to him and tell him what was going on. Uh, we asked him to come back to the house mm -hmm. to bless it. You know, the blessing hadn't worked. Mm -hmm. um, the, that when we got through to him the next morning after our last night there and he asked us why we were still there, that's, that's when it was like slammed home. we got to leave. He's not coming here. He's not going to do anything, and we're not going through any more of this. Well, did he ever break down and actually tell you what he really thought about that house? Obviously, if he said, well, you're still there like that. Yes, he did. And then, it was after we moved out. Yeah, and what did he say? His words were almost parallel to Father Malachi's in, in some ways. He said they knew about the house, meaning the archdiocese, the Catholic Church. Oh, that they knew that, the, that there had been things that had gone on when the DeFeos were there. The DeFeos had had a masses said there, which may have very well triggered what went on for them, just like having the house blessed did for us. When I heard, and I never heard the words myself on your show that Father Malachi said, but when I heard that, he said the church knew about this. Yes. That was not a surprise to me. It was a surprise that he said it on the air live because the church has denied and denied and denied the 
existence of evil in the house at that time. Well, George, uh, Father Martin um, admitted and said a lot of things that the church uh, as an organization would not be willing to. Uh, Father Martin was close to a couple of popes. He was way up in the Catholic Church at one point. Uh, uh, Father Martin uh, said some things about the church and the Vatican itself that I'm sure the Vatican would pref have preferred he not say. Um, but that he... was, I, I considered that truly a heroic act Oh, indeed. when I heard that, because it, the church has gone to great lengths in different interviews and at different times to deny that there, was any, you know, that there was any validity to this case. And for him to say that and know it, and I've heard this from other priests in, privately over the years, but the church has never, you know, said, look, we know there's a problem with the DeFeos and that house, and we, we believe that there's something really wrong there. You know, it's a strange thing, George, when you think about it a little bit. My wife is a non-practicing Catholic. Um, I'm not a Catholic, and I'm, 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 I think I'm, you know, I'm not very strictly in a church religious way. That's not me. I, I'm, I, I think that I, I certainly believe in a creator and so forth and so on, but it, I think it's strange, George, that the church itself, which preaches that there is a God and there is a heaven and there is all the rest of it, uh, seems, in, uh, particularly in modern times, to be in denial about the opposite, about evil, which so obviously to even a, a halfway rationally thinking person ought to be if you've got good. I mean, there seems to be an opposite to everything. Then you, there's also evil in the world, and the church seems to be in official denial about evil. You agree with that? I think of it in a different way. I'm not going to say, say that I disagree with you. I understand why you say what you do. I, and I have no idea really why I'm more tolerant maybe than, than being so quick to condemn the Catholic Church like so many people are right now. I don't know if this they, is a really – I don't know if it's a condemnation. I understand, uh, but it, I, I – I, look, I'm – I'm a divorced Catholic. I can't partake of the sacraments. I became a Catholic after this, voluntarily. At one point, I was a Eucharistic minister in, in San Diego, at the Mission San Diego de Alcala, which is the Basilica in San Diego. Nothing pleased me more than to be a part of the church. But when I got divorced from Kathy, that was mm -hmm. my ability to, to partake of the sacraments was gone. And that hurt, and it still does. I went to Mass for the first time on Christmas Eve, first time in something like 13, 12 or 13 years wow. this last week. And it wasn't the same as going to a Mass that Father Ray said. When you went to Mass for, with Father Ray, it was a joyous celebration. Mm -hmm. And this was a serious Christmas Eve Mass, and there was nothing wrong with it. It just... It was like the heart had gone out of some of it. And I miss that. And I will always support the church, the Catholic Church. And, and if they have, for their reasons, done and said things that they believe are right and, and they can believe in their heart is true, okay. But we have pictures of apparently what is a, re, a very good likeness of of Padre Pio, who is now St. Pio, in the house, appearing to, um, there on the side of a moose head that was my grandfather's. And at the time that that picture was taken, Lorraine Warren, is, is one of the psychics who was in the house, who's been on your show, um, was saying a prayer to Padre Pio, asking him to come and be with her in spirit there at the house. This is during the investigation. And so, I don't, you know, I, the picture is more important to me than what the church says, what some uh, priest says that wasn't there, yes. okay? The picture means more to me. And I hold Padre Pio very dear in my heart, um, and always will. George, the last night, the last night in the house, they, they, what, did you, uh, do you remember the time, the actual time of day you left? Was it morning? Was it nighttime? I, Somewhere it's around four in the afternoon. Four in the oh, in the afternoon, really. So you had uh, that horrible night 
where you couldn't get out of bed, and then you had all day long until 4 in the afternoon before you left that house. What, yes. was, what was that day like? Well, it's, it's <laughs> that's that idea that the house doesn't want you to leave. Um, getting out of that house wasn't easy, even after Father Ray saying, what are you still doing there? Get out. Go. Can't you go someplace? You can go to Kathy's mom's house. Go someplace. Go to Lee's mom's house. Did he think you could ever get back in, or did he mean leave and don't ever go back? No, he never. He, I don't think we would have left if he had said, uh, as silly as that sounds, I don't think we would have left if, if he had said to us, no, you're leaving and you're leaving your stuff and you're not coming back and, and forget it. I don't think he could have gotten us out. I think without him choosing the right words, that was one of those things about meeting him that was just so, so extraordinary about him. Um, he later went on and got a degree in, in forensic psychiatry. He he just knew what to say to move you, to get you to do what you needed to do, even if you were in denial. The only other priest I ever found like that was the Archbishop of Canterbury's exorcist, Reverend Neil Smith. And that was years later when we did a, a book tour for the original book in London, England. We met with him through a reporter for the New York Times. I'm sorry, for the London Times. Her name is Danny Brooke, and she had even published a book on natural childbirth. She was quite a well-known reporter at the time, and she introduced us, made arrangements to meet with Reverend Neil Smith, and he performed for us what some people would call an exorcism. I, I call it more of a blessing, um, but it was a real, it was a rite of separation in the Anglican Church, and it was a separation from the house, from the effects of the house. He, he looked right at Kathy and said, you're still affected by this. Did Father Ray think that if you didn't leave that house, somebody was going to die? Yes, he did. Hold on, George. George Lutz is my guest. He, along with his family, lived the Amityville horror. Tonight you're hearing what really went on in that house. From the high desert, I'm Art Bell. The Amityville horror, the real thing. George Lutz is here. He, with his family, lived the Amityville horror, the real thing. That's what we're talking about tonight. We'll get right back to it. Stay right there. Don't fear the Reaper. I, I don't fear death, but I do fear evil. Uh, there's a big difference, I think. Now, uh, George, I, I'm going to revisit this again. And I know you've never really answered this publicly. When I asked you about your state of mind through this and whether you ever thought that you were perhaps on the edge or even considering, even flitting through your mind that you might do something bad, um, there was a story that you t took your gun. You had a gun. Yes, I I, guess, right? I'm sorry, I can't get this to go off of speakerphone now, so I'm going to have to talk to you on the speaker. I hope that's Oh, that's really bad. Uh, let's see, just put it on hold and then pick up the phone. Try that. It didn't work. It didn't work? No, sir, for the whole break I've been trying to get this to go off of speaker. I was on the speaker so I could make sure I got back here on time. Oh, my goodness. Um, all right. Uh, maybe it's still following you from Amityville. I mean, that shouldn't be. No, this is the first time it's ever happened with us. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call your number back. Okay, if you hang up on me, that, uh, then I'll just pick it up and, and it won't be on speaker. You got it. Okay, sorry right. about this. That's all right. Maybe something is following us. Who knows? <laughs> oh, wait a minute. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Go away. There we go. Well, now isn't that strange? My phone is acting strange, too. Try this again. All right. Let's give it a try. This is really weird. You never know. Uh, you never know. Sometimes just talking about these th things uh, seems to bring them uh, on. I've been concerned about that for years. Let's give it a try here. George, are we back on the phone? Yes, I am. All right. Oh, very good. All right. Uh, let me try again now. Uh, George, again, with regard to your state of mind, um, there was a story 
that you went to the Amityville Police Department and you turned in your gun, uh, saying that you perhaps had an impulse to murder your family. Uh, is that a bogus story, or yeah. did, did you turn in your gun? I had a license to carry a firearm in Nassau and Suffolk counties in upstate New York, but not in the five boroughs in New York City. Right. And the Sullivan Act in New York prohibited that, prohibits it, and it, it's a felony. Right. So we were going into the city, so the proper thing to do is to drop it off at a local police station. That's what I always did. Uh-huh. No, nothing else to that story. So there was nothing about any impulse or any no. of the rest of it. It was just no. you dropped it off. Right. That's what you're supposed to do. Were you ever concerned about the fact that you were in possession of a gun? I mean, did that ever give you pause for thought? Well, it's a responsibility, but not in, in terms of the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That's what I meant. Yeah, not in terms of the house. No, I had a cash payroll for my business. That's why I had a license to carry. It's not an easy thing to get. I know. Um, all right. You left the house 4 o'clock at 1 afternoon. You just... Enough is enough. You you left. I mean, did you did you? What did you think at that moment? Did you think, look, I'm leaving this house. I'm never coming back. I'm going to leave everything I own virtually in the house and just get in the car and go. No, absolutely not. Probably would not have left the house. Art would probably would not. Have, I, I wouldn't have been able to give it up. My boats, motorcycles, everything was there. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> a little thing like the 16 millimeter movies of my whole family. I had just gotten them from my mom so that I could put them together and and, and make a family movie from the time we were little kids, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. It just goes on and on and on. The, uh, no, we were going to Kathy's mom's to stay there at Father Ray's direction, suggestion, and that was the mission. Just, get, just leave the house with the boys, a couple changes of clothes, and go. Get the dog and go. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. It was... The, the world became very small there. You didn't want to go out, and leaving the house was a problem. Um, and so to venture someplace, you had to, like, form it in your mind. I, I didn't go to the office anywhere near as often as I had before this. I mean, before I'd go, you know, six days a week, sometimes seven. I'd be lucky to show up three times a week while I was living in that house. Really? Really? So it was having a profound psychological effect on you. It changed everyone's point of view about life and what was important. When Kathy always described the house as charming, and then she thought about it after we left and said, yeah, it really was charming. It really charmed her. Huh. Um, so you intended what then? Uh, when you left, uh, you were going to come back. In other words, you thought you would come back eventually. Oh, yes, and for... I'd say the first week out of the house, the hardest thing for me was to drive past that exit and go on to Kathy's mom's house. So all my stuff is there. And keep going, yeah. So, and there were a couple times when it was, a, it was a real struggle to just mentally keep going to Kathy's mom's house and not stop and check on my stuff. So, George, why didn't you go back? What stopped you? I went back once with another psychic, that's, his name is Dr. Heffernan. Um, he said that he cleared the house. He said that we would, Kathy didn't come with me. Uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. He had a little girl with him. He went into trance. He had someone else with him as well. Mm -hmm. And he said we would smell violets and know that the house was, was cleared. I didn't smell them. I wasn't convinced. And that was the last time I was there. So when, when Laura DeDeo found the Warrens and got them to come down, she had wanted to get Hans Holzer to come, and he was busy at the time. He, he went to the house later. Uh, I met with them, gave them the key, but I would not go in the house. Yeah, I heard that. that the idea was to get the house fixed. When they, t when they tell me the house is fixed, then I'll you know, go back, but not until... And when Ed Warren said this is, and he wanted, you know, then they went in, Ed and Lorraine and, and Laura Dale went in the house, and Ed said he wanted to put more people together and come back with a team. And we invited in the people from Duke University, from the Psychical Research Institute there. 
And, you know, Mary maybe didn't make it clearer earlier, earlier this evening. She had her own school where she taught psychic in Connecticut, and after leaving the house, she moved to Florida. She up and left. The house affected her, her life so much uh, that... Well, they came in with the team, and they all met, and, gave, you know, they still had the key. And it was like, okay, go do what you're going to do. And when Ed came back afterwards and said, I'm not going back, I, I can't do this, and you're going to have to get a, an exorcist to come in and exercise the house. He's going to have to say mass in the house, mm -hmm. and basically he'll be putting his life on the line to do it. Uh, how do you go and ask someone to do that for a house? Yeah. So... Then we were. Then the idea started to settle in that we're we're stuck here now. Um, we've got this. We've got everything there. I've still got my business, and we're living in Kathy's mom's house. But life can't continue this way. Was there a, was there a profound change when you moved to uh, out of the, to your relative's house? I mean, did was there a profound relief? Was it? Obviously, at that point, over, or was something still with you? No, it kept going on. It kept on, but it was different. Um, Kathy turned into the old woman again in front of her mom, which then gave a, a witness that was different from just me. Sure. Kathy and I, uh, when we took the polygraph test years later with Chris Gugas, one of the things we wanted to make sure that got covered in the test was: Is it true that you levitated at your mom at Kathy's mom's house after leaving? The house and everything. Yes, we did. And we levitated together that time, and that was a pleasant experience. That was not scary or frightening. We were talking to each other, and we were in the bedroom, um, and we shared a little single bed there, a little cot. Um, but that, was, that wasn't an unpleasant experience by any means. Uh, George, does Kathy uh, still talk about this or not? She did for the History Channel two years ago right now, even getting up is a real problem for her physically. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's eight hours of tape that MPH has that we did that interview side by side. So I would have to say yes, of course. When the, the current owners of that house uh, now say that nothing is going on, that they believe the house is clear and everything's just spiffy and okay, do you buy that? I'm glad that they're able to say that, and uh, I have no reason to think otherwise. I'm not there. I haven't been back there in 25 years. Uh, whatever's going on for them is, is, is their business. They knew what they were buying when they bought it. Well, by then, they certainly did. We gave it back to the bank. Couldn't they just stomach the idea of selling it to another family. You know, that's, that's another thing that I think the audience should understand. There have been allegations over the years that this was a hoax, that some was some big money-making affair on your part. Um, so you, you lost the house. You had to give the house back to the bank. And while people have made millions, I guess, on the book and the movie and whatever all else has come out about Amityville, uh, the History Channel, I, I forget, or, or ABC, I can't recall which one, said, look, the... Um, uh, the Lutzes uh, may have made a grand total of $300,000, minus, no doubt, attorney's fees and a lot of other stuff. No, so, I think the 300000 would uh, so would be the spendable after the taxes and all the rest. And even after attorneys. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, there have been a number of lawsuits about this over the years. The, what, what happened is we moved out in January of 76. We bought it in November, so 28 days later when we moved out, which is a, like a full cycle of the moon, um, which I don't know what the, whether that matters or not. But the we we kept we eventually I sold my business. I put it up for um, sale in the Long Island the, in the New York State Surveyor's Civil Engineering Magazine, and the first buyer bought it. We wrote up a contract right then and there between the two of us. Um, a couple of days later, his attorney and my attorney put it into a formal language. Transferred the ownership. Uh, my grandfather had died during that time, and some of his furniture that my mom and, and my aunts did not want from his house, we got some of that furniture, and I had one motorcycle that I managed to hold on to, and 
salvage from the whole thing. A couple people went in on Easter Sunday for us and got my grandfather's chest back out, which was uh, a bit, just about all that we were able to get out of the house. We donated the food to the Salvation Army, and hmm. that was it for that. In On Mother's Day of 1976, we landed in San Diego on a plane. We gave gave the car away. To, I, one of the last office cars that I had um, gave it to the guy that uh, was at the ticket place where you show up at JFK and said, here, you know, here's the keys, here's the title. Oh, you don't my need God. And You were really cutting all ties, weren't you? Oh, it was gone, yeah, you bet. I had one car still there that we had bought. We got rid of the van because it developed a problem that wouldn't go away. Um, so I had bought a, a 1973 Thunderbird, a used car, um, that we used. For, and then I left that at Father Ray's rectory. And we went on out to San Diego, and we got off the plane there, and we had hotel reservations up in Del Mar, and we stayed at the Del Mar Inn for a couple of weeks, and uh, Cavi found a condo for us to rent over in La Jolla, and we stayed there for a while, and then I went back to get the car, and meanwhile, Cavi had found a house out in Tierra Santa, and we moved there and rented a house for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and then eventually we bought a house up in uh, Carlsbad. And at this point, uh, do you think the effect of what had happened to you was gone or still in some way with you? I kind of always looked at it like it had a half-life. Uh, I eventually came to believe that the half-life wasn't necessarily the same as it would have been for something radioactive, but that as time went on, it would, it would go away, it would get less, it would get less. There were many times when we really made an effort not to blame everything that went wrong in our lives on the house. On the house. Yeah. And so we would be asked and we'd say, yeah, you know, it appears to be over. It's over. You know, um, for us it's gone. And then so, so many other things would go wrong. Uh, I'll give you an example. When, the, we, when we left New York, we didn't have a book contract. We had a, a – Weber, DeFeo's attorney, had asked us to sign a book contract with him, and we refused because he was – because of all the – this it was a really thick contract, and it was very disturbing. Um, this was a guy that was trying to get us to donate the house to his corporation and then take lie detector tests. And if we failed the lie detector tests, then we were going to give him the house anyway and everything else. Plus, he was going to get to say what we did with the rest of our lives with regard to the story. And, and it was just beyond belief. Plus, he was going to pay to fail 5% of proceeds for murdering his family. So a friend of ours hooked us up with Tam Mossman, who's the editor for Jane Roberts' books, the Seth Speaks books uh, that Prentice Hall had published. And Tam Mossman knew Jay Anson and had suggested him. We met with Jay Anson. We spoke with him. We gave him um, the research materials we had done on the house and some tapes that Kathy and I had done uh, just to undo this. We were sitting around talking about it at Kathy's mom's house afterwards, over the weeks after we had left the house and said, look, we're not going to sit down and be interviewed about this. You can do what you can from the tapes, and then we'll try to color, correct whatever you write or help you out with that, but we're just not going to relive this. We've done it once, and we're not doing it again. We did it for the tapes. We went to California, and a year and a half later, as, it, as the end of August in 1977 is when we actually had a book contract. Then, in the, right after that, Anson sold the rights for the uh, movie rights, to CBS without our permission. He just went ahead and did it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, AIP found out about American International Pictures, and what they did was they uh, went and got the rights from CBS and came to us and said, we're going to make a movie. And we said, how are you going to do that? You don't have our permission to do that, and it's our story. And so we had to renegotiate all of that. And in the process of that, then we were finally able to get some control back over what happened with the story in the future, not then, but in the future. So we got what's known as the sequel rights, which is very rare. You just don't do that, and it was just one of those things that just happened to work out right. Uh, who was ever thinking of sequels then? No, of course. The uh, Anson did a deal with us that it was about eight, nine years later that we discovered that he and Myron Saland, who he had worked for at the time at Professional Films, they became the producers for the movie, and so far they've made about $22 million personally between the two of them. So, in other words, a lot of people 
have made a lot of money. Well, Anson and Salam, from this, the author of the original book, they, he made at least $10 million for himself. Millions and millions. And yes. you, you cleared maybe 300000 We cleared after taxes and lawyers, yeah. <laughs> 300000 So We got the sequel right, so no one can do anything with the Abigail Horror Story in the future without our permission. Mm-hmm. Which may, uh, I guess one can hope, will turn out well for you. Who knows? Well, my attitude about it has always been one that not necessarily everyone um, understands or agrees with, but it's one I came to on my own, and, I'm, uh, and that is that whatever exposes, this stuff happens, and, we're, and we didn't know that. And we learned that from the people that we were fortunate enough to meet along the way, and people don't talk about it. And we can understand why they don't, because we understood there'd be controversy, and we understood there'd be naysayers and... Oh, there's always those, George. I've had them all the time I've been doing this program. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. When we get back, we'll try and pick up a few uh, questions from all of you out there. You've got the numbers. We're here. George Lux is my guest. He, with his family, lived the real Amityville horror. In a moment, we'll get back to him. If you have a question, uh, that's what our phone lines are for. So, uh... Now or never. I'm intensely uh, curious about something, George. Uh, you contacted me, and you obviously then wanted to do this interview. I wonder why. You're going off the air, and I never have talked to you. You <laughs> have true. The, the greatest respect around the, the country, oh, that's around the world, kind of about the, these kinds of things. Well, I, I surely uh, appreciate your having contacted me. And the, there's another side to this, I, I, and you and I spoke of this. Yes. Um, the, the part about Father Malachi Martin was very important to me. I haven't been able to verify it with your archives. It's just my inability to find the right program when he said that. And when he exposed it for what it was, and, and that was very important to me. But also, there, over the years, there have been some, I don't know another way to put it, real loudmouth people about, you know, calling this a hoax, and it's not a hoax. And I've gotten to the point where I'm really tired of even hearing that. Yeah, I never, I never uh, thought it was a hoax, George, for what that's worth. It, it's the kind of thing that has hurt my family for a long time, and... I've gotten to a place mentally or spiritually with it all that just says, you know, I'll bring it on because this is what happens. This is the truth. These things happen, and I understand why people don't talk about them when they do happen to mm -hmm. them. Uh, in my own opinion, I would I would do fictional books, fiction books based on fact and factual books, anything at all to expose the existence of this stuff, to get people to read about it and question it. All right. Uh, I've got somebody else you might know on the phone. Joel Martin. Joel was the uh, Long Island correspondent for the Associated Press at the time of the DeFeo massacre, the first reporter actually to arrive at the scene of those murders. Uh, Joel, hi. Thank you for, for getting to us. You're on the air, Joel. Oh, good morning, Art. Good morning. Thank hi, Joel. Joel. It's time to talk to me. Yes, hello, George. I haven't. Uh, you and I have really never met. No, we, we were on the History Channel special together, and we talked on the phone years ago. But somehow we kept missing each other. We were on the Lou Gentilly show at the yes, same time. Yes, I was on the Lou Gentilly show recently as well. Yes, and as you know, I was the first reporter there that horrible night in November of 1974. And I saw one of the dead bodies and later was questioned by the DA and then, you know, became involved with the, the, the side of the story that uh, called it a hoax, as you just uh, referred to. And, uh, I, you know, had years and years of listening to Stephen Kaplan debate the Webbers and, uh, I believe, I'm, forgive me, the Warrens about whether it was true or not. And I really have not the same opinion as Steve Kaplan had that it was a, a, a hoax. And I don't believe that at all. What I wanted you to do, I was hopeful, was to clear up some of the questions I had because when I was there the first night in 74, I never thought the story would continue. Then five years later, I had that exclusive radio interview with Bill Weber, and he contradicted a lot of what you said, or at least, you know, raised doubts about it. Joel, 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 what do you want cleared up? I, what I'd like cleared up is what George Lutz's opinion is of what Kaplan said, which was counter to what George said, and what Bill Weber said, which 
took issue with what George said. And I, I don't want to argue it. I would just love to hear George's opinion, simply because we haven't meant to talk about it. All right. George? Actually, you can add a new one to that, someone that calls herself Geraldine DeFeo as well. And I understand, oh, yeah. you know, that she... Keys to the Rockies, call toll-free 1-800-825-5033. That he interviewed you recently. He met me. He, he, he and Geraldine did both meet me. That's right. Did they interview you? Well, they, you know, they, they asked questions, frankly. It wasn't a formal interview where we sat down and they, you know, said, well, let's take notes. It wasn't the kind of thing a reporter does. But, yeah, they, they definitely questioned me. And, they definitely and is she talked. someone that you knew back then? Was, was uh, he? Geraldine. It's interesting about Geraldine. Geraldine claims to be married to, uh, to Ronnie DeFeo. Yes. Geraldine's physical appearance today, to be kind, is not anywhere near what it looked like back in the 1970s. Now, I don't know what her role was back in the 1970s, but if you ask me do I recognize a girl who looks something like that back around the time when this happened, yeah, she does look like her. But what she did or what her role was, you would know. And those are the kind of things I was curious about getting answered since I never believed or, or I, I never thought I'd fall into the story though so heavily. Did, did you ever hear back then that she was married to him? Back then? Yes. No, no. Nothing like that? No. No one ever knew that? No. There was, there was no, no, never brought up in the trial, not by Weber, no one? No. So what? for all practical purposes in the 70s, she didn't exist? For all practical purposes, there was a girl who looked like that, but in terms of the story she tells, no, I never heard that story in the 70s. I never heard that story until much, much more recently. But, uh, I, you know, I recall the face, but that that doesn't necessarily suggest that what she says is, you know, exactly what happened. Well, Joel, you've obviously followed this story for all these years. Oh, God, yeah. Are you, uh, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, do you think something happened in that house that took the Lutzes out of it? Yeah, you know what I, what I think, frankly, I I did not have the privilege of interviewing Malachi and Martin more than one time, and mm -hmm. I know you did many, many times. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah and I, I, but I, I tend to agree with this concept that you mentioned before, and I don't know if you're referring to your own or Malachi and Martin's. I've been listening to it since this began. It's, it's fascinating, by the way. I, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Um, I think that if you say there's good, you have to say there's evil. Mm -hmm. And I do think that if you fool around with things that you don't understand, you could be fooling around with things that are evil. And do you think that's what happened to the Lutzes? Yeah, absolutely. All right, all right, Joel, thank you. And do you, uh, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect there. Do you want to go ahead and address anything, uh, George? Do you want to? Sure, I'd like to uh, deal with what Joel brought up, which was about Stephen Kaplan and, and William Weber. Yeah, far away. They're individuals that came to us in different ways. Um, we sought out Weber, found out that he was the attorney for DeFeo, and so we contacted him through a friend of ours, Mimi Vetter, who uh, worked at, as a receptionist, I believe it was, or, or an assistant of some kind at his um, dentist's office. She got a hold of him for us. We talked with him on the phone, told him that we had lived in the house, um, that we believed we had information that would help get him help of some kind, mm -hmm. help get DeFeo help, and... We agreed to meet with him, and he came over to Kathy's mom's a, a couple of Saturdays, and we sat and we talked. At one time, he introduced to us a, a fellow who was supposed to be a criminologist who eventually did a, an article that was unauthorized that was published in Good Housekeeping magazine and another one in the New York Mirror, I think it was, in the Sunday News Mirror. Uh, Weber was, is a slick guy. He's a guy that will say what he wants to to fit the the moment. It became... Obvious to him when we left for California and had our attorney, Frank Giorgio, notice him formally that our story was ours and we were not going to do a contract with him about a book and we mm -hmm. didn't want anything more to do with that. We weren't interested in, in, in dealing with him. And he, they wrote back and acknowledged that. And then he goes and he gets um, Paul Hoffman to do this Good Housekeeping article. And, and Pernas Hall wasn't even going to publish the book after that was done. It wasn't that the article was inaccurate. The problem was that that was done without our permission under less than honorable circumstances, to say the least. I mean, this guy was represented to us as a criminologist helping Ronald DeFeo get mental help, and instead he's a writer trying to make money for Weber. Yeah, still, I, I can't for one second imagine that you would have two seconds of interest in helping, helping uh, in any way or 
or, or feeling compassion for DeFeo unless you understood a very profound reason why you should feel that compassion, and that could have only come from your experience in the house. I mean, where yeah. else? Are they? And this guy killed that. I mean, he just, he just literally took that possibility of, of DeFeo not sitting in jail for no, and I, I shouldn't say no reason, but for no good purpose. I mean, it's, he belongs in jail, don't misunderstand, but a, a mental jail, one where he can get some help. Yeah. I understand, and we're so short on time. First time caller line, very quickly, uh, you're on the air with George Lux. Do you have a question? Hello? Going once, going twice, go on. Wild card line, you're on the air with George Lux. Do you have a question? All right. Yes. Um, okay. Has, I want to ask him if the proof of uh, this personal proof of evil in his life mm -hmm. has resulted in a in a... A really a personal proof of goodness. I mean... Oh, yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I, I think we answered it the other way around. Uh, yeah. But, but, but really, George, uh, the fact that you experienced that evil uh, validates the fact there's this good as well, right? Father Ray taught me something very interesting that um, at first almost sounded uh, sacrilegious in a way. It sounded weird. He said, you know, the thing about prayer is that it makes God say yes when he had said no all along. <laughs> um, that answers it, I guess. East of the Rockies, you're on there with George Lutz. Hi. Hi. Uh, do you think that uh, your wife, you mentioned that she looked almost like a crone uh, for yes. once or twice or several times. Do you think, did she realize that that change was taking place, or was that just in your eyes that that happened? No, no she realized that it, it, she could look in the mirror, and when her mom was there, it was even it was worse. Yeah, remember, sir, uh, her mother saw this as well. It wasn't just George. Right? Yes. Okay, thank you. You're uh, welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on the air with George Lutz. Do you have a question? Yes, hello. Hello. Um, Ardell is my last farewell. I'm a great fan. Thank you. God bless you, and I look, probably the last time I'll be... They were talking to you for the rest of my life, so God bless you, and I hope and pray that your back will heal. Thank you. And first and foremost, uh, I heard a rumor that the property has a history of uh, some kind of Indian burial ground or some kind of... Oh, yes. Of, of, ...that the ground itself was either sacred or it had some kind of Indian connotation. I actually, I actually heard a rumor that uh, some Indian artifact or skull even had been found... At that property. Is there any uh, truth in any of that, George, that you're aware of? When we first visited the Amityville Historical Society, we obtained maps and, and all kinds of information that we turned over to Anson that included that area as having been a place where there were Indians buried and that they were, they're insane. The ones they didn't know what to do with were there was even a rumor at the time and printed in some of the stuff in the historical society that said they were chained to trees and left to die there. Not the nicest of circumstances by any means. All right. when, the, his, when the Amityville um, story was published, all of a sudden the historical society um, secreted that information away. We've through other people have been in contact with with previous curators that know of this and are willing to talk about it. Hmm. But as far as the town is concerned and the, the Amityville Historical Society, no, that did, that was never true. What happened later was, and, and I was still to, talking about some of, of Weber, Weber invited Hans Holzer to come in and investigate the house. Mm -hmm. Now, Holzer is on shows like Joel Martin saying, you know, this whole thing's a hoax. But then he's calling up Hans Holzer to go in and verify that the house is haunted. Pretty weird stuff when you put the two things together. Why is this guy double-dealing this way? How does the town of Amityville now handle all, the, all of this? I mean, since? Well, they're not going to shut Holzer up, and Holzer says without a doubt, you know, what happened there with Ethel Johnson Myers when she went in trance was there's an Indian chief, and he's quite angry, and he's not going to go away until some things are restored back the way he thinks they should be. Now, I don't know about that. I wasn't there. I didn't own the house at the time. Weber made arrangements to go in with the bank because we'd given it back to the bank by then. Uh, the, the historical society has basically covered it up from what I can determine, from what anyone else can determine since then.
in your opinion. So, um, but but now the the town of Amityville, I mean, they, they must have a chamber of commerce there at Amityville. How do they? Well, that, we've never been there. Favorite people. I'll, I'll... That's for sure. No, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with uh, George Lutz. Hello. Hi. Hi. Lee, I just want to, you're obviously right about giving Art the respect he's due. I'm honored he took my call. I just want to say, Lee, this whole experience is obviously very personal to you. But as I heard, and I listened very intently to the Art's whole interview with you, I was kind of shocked when you got to the part that you said you and Kathy weren't together anymore, and I was wondering if you can say when you divorced and why, if it had anything to do with this or her turning into an old woman, it just that just seemed kind of odd. Her turning into an old woman didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, but did the half-life of what happened uh, and, and still uh, uh, maybe uh, in some way present, did that, do you think that had anything to do with it, George? The reasons we got divorced are really personal. We went in separate directions with regard to, to our own personal lives and religion, um, our main interest, and, and we still talk, uh, is the kids and of course. their lives. And, and we're both very proud of, of our kids, all five of them. And, and we went on and had two more children after we left. Um, three of my daughters today are ministers. Uh, Isn't that something? We couldn't be prouder of them, and, and so the reasons we got divorced, they're our own. They're our own reasons. They're not something for the public, but um, we we really just did go in separate ways. And you don't think any of uh, there was any residual effect that? I mean, sometimes it's really hard to to know what drives something, but you think uh, you you think it had really nothing to do with it. Is that right? No, it's not right. I I will say this much. We disagreed about exposing the house in that my, my own thoughts are and my own belief is that whatever exposes what went on there, whatever gets people to talk about this as a real problem that exists in the world, that's shoved under the carpet every moment that it possibly can be and in all kinds of ways and all, with all kinds of confusion, it should be exposed. As far as Kathy is concerned, she, her point is that she only wants to deal with the nonfiction part and does not believe that fiction also helps to do that. So we differ right there, and, and that wasn't the reason we got divorced, but when it comes to the house and disagreeing about some things afterwards, then that's part of it. So there's really no part of all this that has not affected your life, is there? <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. Um, <laughs> Even through your cold and all that, you've still got a good sense of humor, George. Listen, we're out of time. I uh, really don't know how to thank you for coming and giving me this interview toward the end of, uh, of my time on the air, permanently anyway, and so, George, thank you. Art, thank you for having me on. And, and anyone that's interested in any more that, that they would like to find out about this, the Lou Gentilly Show, LouGentilly.com, has an archive up for a whole Amityville week that we did uh, earlier this year. So that might help also. All right, my friend. Thank uh, you, Art. I, I appreciate the interview. I appreciate uh, how candid you have been. And take care, my friend. I wish you well, and I'll send you what you asked for. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Uh, good night, George. Good night, all. And here's Crystal to take us out from the high desert. Ta-ta.